At a glance, Alex Bellotti appears to be quiet and shy. But upon further interaction, one is confronted with an unmistakable vigor for life and an inherently vibrant personality. Finding words to describe Alex is difficult because any list of adjectives I write down sounds cliched, when in reality, these words are unsurprisingly accurate. She is humble, reliable, hardworking, determined, easygoing, and honest. I first met Alex in sixth grade, just after she started at Notre Dame Academy after a year of battling Ewing sarcoma. As most of you know, her battle with cancer resumed five years later in October of her sophomore year at EA. I believe that a person's character is defined by his or her reaction to major setbacks such as this. Alex blew away any notion I ever had about how a person would respond to a life-threatening disease. After multiple rounds of treatment, I expected Alex to be emotionally exhausted and reclusive. However, rather than be pushed to attend school, Alex pushed others to let her continue living a normal life. She was eager, vivacious, and determined. Definitely not the characteristics I would expect of a cancer patient. But this is Alex. Alex is truly an inspiration. I could not imagine managing the EA workload, applying to colleges, and hoping to graduate with my class, all while conquering cancer for a second time. However, Alex does all this in stride and will continue to exude this contagious optimism at the University of Pennsylvania next year. Personally, imagining school next year without Alex is difficult, but I know a friend like her is the kind that I will have forever. My mom once told me that she is thankful for Alex because she has taught me lessons which nobody else could. It is an understatement to say that I have been blessed to have Alex a part of my life. Please stand to greet a member of the class of 2012, a very special person, our very own snowball queen, and my very best friend, Alex Bellotti. Thank you, Catherine. Please be seated. In ancient Rome, for a period of about 500 years, there lived a group of people more powerful than anyone has ever been. They were the emperors, and they had absolute control over perhaps the greatest dynasty in history. They could do whatever they wanted. They could enslave people, create laws, declare war over entire countries, or if they really wanted, nothing at all. And yet, the Romans didn't stick around for 500 years by letting whoever happened to hold power really do whatever they wanted. Further, it would seem that without laws, there was no way for the emperor to be controlled. But there was. For though the emperors were powerful, the greatest among men, what they were also was mortal. And in this, they were like every man or woman who ever lived before them, and every man, woman, or child who has lived since. And so, to be sure that their emperors behaved and remembered what mattered, two servants were always placed behind the emperor. They were his constant companions. And if ever the emperor was full of himself, or too angry, or wanting to do something for personal reasons that would potentially damage Rome, the servants would always whisper, memento mori, which means remember your mortality. For although at his peak today, tomorrow the emperor could fall. And thus, although memento mori means remember you will die, what it produced in the emperors was a consciousness of the moment, of the fleetingness of life and of time. And thus, for them to remember death was really to know what matters and remember how to live. All of you here probably know my story, or at least the one that has attempted to define me. And part of the reason I am here is to tell it, and of course, to tell what I have learned from it. But much more than that, I would like to speak about the universal things, the things far, far bigger than myself that my small personal journey has brought me into contact with. Though they start with three big words, life, cancer, and death, they end at a very different place. Although they are big words, 
What I don't have is big, easy answers. I don't have any answers about life or how to live it. In fact, what I've gone through has only taught me that any easy answer to such a wonderfully complex thing is foolish. But what I do know is that though we think of life and death as two totally separate things, opposites in fact, without one, the other does not exist. And for me, and maybe long ago some Roman emperors, the start of living a life as opposed to just being alive began not with life and adventure and happiness, but frankly with becoming aware of death. I know how that sounds. We as a culture, as a society, as a school, as individuals are terrified of that word. But like a lot of the things that we're scared of, we're not necessarily scared of them, more we're scared because we don't know how to integrate them into the rest of our lives. We have trouble admitting we were wrong as if it would negate our future abilities to be right. We don't know how to admit that we've been a bad friend because we think it would mean that we were never a good one. And we couldn't possibly confront something like death because from our perspective, we view it as an indefinite end. However, from another perspective, I feel as though it can make you view life differently. As we have seen in this community, its permanence is tragic and assured. But I am not talking about dying. I am talking about confronting death, which even though it may use the same words, I promise is a radically different thing. On June 21, 2004, I was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, a rare childhood cancer. I was 11. I know being so young for such a serious thing as cancer sounds scary, but in truth, I think I was more terrified by what I couldn't comprehend than what I could. See, no one in my life had ever died, at least no one I was close to. I had never even been to a hospital before, not for me or for anyone else. The first time we went there, my mom and I didn't even know what the word oncology meant. It had started with a pain in my side that just wouldn't go away, or to see it another way, it, being my life with cancer, began a few weeks later when I was called back into the hospital after receiving scans to check up on the pain on my side that everyone originally had thought was the pneumonia. But then they saw on the scan that the pneumonia was growing larger. The scene at my house upon hearing this news was just as frantic as you would imagine. I vividly remember hearing my dad whisper to my mom she might not make it. Everyone was crying all around me. Up until this chaotic point in my life, chaotic, I promise you, being an understatement, I never contemplated not living or even that dying was a possibility. I didn't completely understand what was going on. As we arrived at the hospital and entered the lobby where the elevators were, we didn't have the slightest clue as to where we should go. All we had was that awful word repeating in our heads and a fear for the worst. Our fragility, our absolute inability to fit into the scene was so apparent that an elderly woman who worked at the hospital appeared out of nowhere with a wheelchair to take me to where I needed to be. After that, for a year, I underwent treatment. First, I was given another scan to find out exactly what the mass in my side was. Then I underwent biopsies, which showed that the cancer was not only in my side, but had also spread to my head and a few other places in my body. Starting immediately, I received six rounds of chemotherapy. Each lasted around a week and would give me fevers between cycles that would put me in the hospital for a few days in addition to the treatments. So you can imagine, I was miserable. After all the chemo, I had surgery in which they removed the large tumor on my side along with some of the ribs themselves. Finally, I underwent two bone marrow transplants and localized radiation. All of this, as I said, lasted a year. And I don't know if you can recall when you were 11, but back then, a year was a very, very long time. Cancer is a peculiar thing. During what can only be described as a pivotal moment, Life, as I remember it, was a somber blur of treatments and sickness. However, I seem to have retained a small collection of distinct moments of clarity. It's these moments, characterized by their melancholic nature, which pushed me to stop dwelling on death and to work for a life I didn't have. I got sick right before sixth grade. 
having gone to parochial school where you stay in the same classroom for every subject and have to bring your lunch to school every day, I was so scared I would miss out on all the new experiences I'd been yearning for at the new middle school that I was going to attend. I wouldn't be able to experience having a locker. You know, I really wanted a locker. Experience the unexpectedness and fun of switching classrooms in between periods, of waiting in the lunch line with my tray to buy food from the cafeteria. I can remember sitting in my living room, watching a Cinderella story with no hair on my head, wondering if I'd ever have friends again or be able to go to a party. Because all that had been taken away from me, I began to find how much I appreciated the littlest things. I remember commonalities such as food and school became twisted and unfamiliar. Chemotherapy altered my taste buds so badly that everything seemed to have an almost poisonous taste. I wasn't worried about how good the food tasted, but whether eating it was even bearable. That same year, while going through treatment, I was only able to attend five or six days of school. I was repeatedly absent throughout my first year of middle school, and so I decided to repeat the sixth grade in order to experience what I had missed. And yet, as terrible as going through a year of treatment was, and it was terrible, life after that torturous year was completely the opposite. It was great. There's a magic to pain. It hurts so much when it's there, but unlike a failed test or a broken relationship, it disappears as quickly as it came. And because all of my senses had been dulled and affected by my treatments, when they returned, I, began, I became just that much more aware and appreciate, appreciative of my surroundings. I tried to attend every social event possible, couldn't get enough of my friends, a lot of the time staying with them for almost the entire weekend. And frankly, it was just amazing not to feel sick. But then, here's the funny thing. At some point, somewhere, I began to forget. I guess that's the thing about pleasure, about good things too. Too much of them can dull our senses just like the worst chemotherapy. See, the trouble with our society, or at least the trouble for me, is that it all feels so great. Our phones, or should I say Siri, can provide restaurant suggestions, text all your friends where and when to meet, and supply driving directions. Our rom-coms depict perfectly constructed and easily predictable fairy tale lives. And we have at, have at max one month to wear our newest clothes before we spot our own picture in the what not to wear section of Us Weekly. But see, as great as all this stuff is, collectively and repetitively, in dosage after dulling dosage, it leads to one thing. And that thing is forgetting. See, when we forget that we are going to die, then we forget everything else too. Wrapped up in materialism, we don't pay attention to the riches of life that at any moment can be taken away from us. We forget that if we don't stop this minute and fix our relationship, apologize, move on, whatever it may be, that we won't, that we never will. We forget that simply saying hi to someone might completely turn that person's day around, and that if we don't, one day when we can't, we will yearn for the opportunity to do so. We forget, and instead, we go for the next meal, the next nap, the next run, without even thinking about it. But here's the thing. I know it sounds right now like I, the girl who had cancer, am telling you what you don't know about life. That because I was so close to death once, I would appreciate life so much that I would never forget. And sure, when I was really sick and had no hair, all I thought about was how nice I would look when it grew back. But when it grew back, sometimes I complained about my hair. It was wavy when I wanted it to be straight, straight when I wanted it to be wavy, and was never thick or shiny enough. See, that's the thing. The stuff that matters in life never comes easy, not to anyone, no matter what good or bad you've been through. Although my cancer resurfaced sophomore year, and I treat it for another two more years, finishing in November, I am currently in remission and loving every second of it. As far as cancer is concerned, it is not who I am, but rather a situation that, whether I like it or not, is a part of my life. It will never take away from my personality, but rather allow me to view the world in a different way than I would have. As far as I'm concerned, I, know, I now know that I can deal with the good and the bad, and that every day I am learning to handle situations as they occur. 
I don't come here today claiming to know the answers, and I hope that's not what you will come away with. If I were asked, do you wish you never had cancer? I would hesitate before responding. Of course I didn't enjoy going through all of the horrible things, but if I knew that I, I would be okay in the end, would I have gained from my experience? It was my wake-up call to appreciate life beauty, to think about what I was doing on a much deeper level, and savor the experiences that pass us by. But I do know this. Because cancer chose me, and because of what I've gone through, I've been given a rare glimpse of death. If I would like you to leave with anything, it would be to think of one of those servants whispering to the emperor, memento mori, remember death. Don't dwell on it, don't get lost in it, just remember it and live your life accordingly. And though I think each person is entitled to figuring out what that means for themselves, for me at least, it has meant to live from a deeper spot. Not to do more, but to appreciate more. Not to, be always, not to always be happy, but to figure out why I'm sad. To carve into this stuff called life, because I know that at some point, I and those around me will no longer be here to do so. Thank you.